Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Gary Francioni, Professor Gary Francioni, as our next, our first keynote speaker. He is the first person in America to start teaching animal rights in the universities. He is the first advocate of animal rights, has been a vegetarian for about 35 years, and for about 31 years, he and his wife both are vegan. Before many of us heard the word vegan, he was practicing. He is a student of Jainism. He has been studying Jainism, practicing it, does not wear leather, does not wear silk. In fact, he pointed out how I was deficient. <laughs> but he was wondering if a white man born in Catholic tradition can be Jain. I told him, by the power vested in me, by the directors of Jaina, <laughs> I pronounce you Jain. <laughs> Come on up. He teaches law and philosophy. It somehow brings Jainism in every class. We are very happy to have him here. Professor Gary Franciani. Jai Janendra. Thank you, Dilipai, for introducing me and for your visionary leadership of Jaina over the past several years. I live near Philadelphia, even though I teach in New Jersey, and um, I've gotten to know Dilip and Salah very well. And uh, Dilip spends 25 hours of every day working on Jaina matters, and uh, <laughs> he's thoroughly devoted to it, and I think he's done a marvelous job. And I want to thank you, all of you, for giving me the very great honor of being in this absolutely beautiful building and having the pleasure and the privilege of addressing you this morning. Um, you know, Jaina is a very important organization. Not only is Jaina trying to bring unity to Jains, but... Oh, okay. But Jane is a, but uh, Jaina is a very important organization for someone like me, who is not Indian, who was not born in the Jain tradition, in terms of integrating me into the Jain community and providing resources for pe for people like me. Through Jaina and Dilip, I have had I've made wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, relationships. I've met, for example, Pravin Shah. Is Pravin here? Ah, Pra, there you are, Pravin. Pravin Shah, who's the head of the Jaina Education Committee, uh, who spends about four hours a week with me on the telephone, as does Sulik Jain, Dr. Sulik Jain. Uh, we talk about all sorts of, of, of doctrines. We talk about the difference between Dravyaman and Bhavman. We talk about everything. And, and, um, and Pravin is currently doing so. I've been an academic for 25 years. I do not think I have ever encountered a project as ambitious as the Jane E. Library. There's a catalog of it that you can pick up while you're at the conference. He has put over 1,800 Jane books, over 700,000 pages on the internet. Anybody here can go to their, can go to their, their computer, get into the Jane E. Library, and download 1,800 Jane books. That is a marvelous, it's just, it's remarkable. And books you can't get anymore. Many of them are just books that are inaccessible. They're not available to anybody. I mean, they're just, it's very, very difficult. He's done a marvelous job. And there are people here who have had a profound influence on me. 
that I want to thank, and many that I won't have time to thank. Um, I would like to thank, for example, I don't know, did Samaniji, Mbutaji, and and uh, and and, uh, and Shuklaji, I don't know if they're here. They're not on stage, but they taught me preksha meditation. Um, and indeed, before they would give me my certificate, they forced me to learn large amounts of Hindi. Um, and and it, they did. And I would like to say, Kritigyosmi. Is that right? Did I get that? Kritigyosmi, if they're here, uh, to them. Uh, they taught me practice on meditation. I would like to say thank you to Buddha Dev Chitra Banuji. Without him, Jainism would still be only with the Jains in this country, and people like me would really have never had access. He brought it here. And I am eternally grateful to Buddha Dev Chitra Banuji. Acharya Chandanaji, who in my judgment is one of the most, one of the greatest examples of the, the dynamism of Ahimsa in the work that she does in Bihar and other places. One of the, one of the most marvelous things that happened to me in the past several years was my friend Vastupal Parikh from Canada asked me to write the foreword to a book called Walk With Me, a book about Bhagwan Mahavir, that Vastupal wrote with Achaiji. And I was very grateful for the opportunity to do that. Thank you. I'm grateful to all of you, and I'm sorry for not mentioning more of you, because there are many people here, Cromwell Crawford, and many, many people here that have had a profound influence on me. I stand before you this morning, not as an American Jane, but as a Jane. I, my Ben, my Baha'i, you are my family, and even though I was not born in India, and I was not born in, in your tradition, I have come to embrace it, I have come to love it, I will live the rest of my life as a Jane, and I will die as a Jane. Um, Now, having said that, I want to say, Michami Dukadam, Michami Dukadam, Michami Dukadam, Michami Dukadam, Michami Dukadam. That's five times. Uh, I want to say that uh, because I'm going to address the topic of this conference now, and I hope that I do not in any way offend anyone. And I'll say Michami Dukadam at the end anyway. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the topic of the conference is. What can Jainism do to contribute to the global ecological movement? That's, that's what we're here to talk about. And my friends, I think the best thing that we can do to contribute to the global ecological movement is to recognize there isn't a global ecological movement. We talk a lot about the ecological crisis. Oh yes, we talk about it. But what we're really talking about is how we can more efficiently exploit the universe. We need to be more efficient in our exploitation. We're not, we're not shifting any paradigm. We're not doing anything to really move in a, in, a, in a direction away from the exploitation of the environment. We're putting a bandage on a gash. You know, we can change our light bulbs. We can drive Priuses. We can put solar panels. I mean, those are good things. But they're too little and they are too late. We are facing an unparalleled ecological crisis. We have the crisis of global warming. We are witnessing the, 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 the destruction of thousands of species. I mean, we focus on, we fetishize a few of the species, like, like the elephants or the tigers or the lions, but there are thousands of species of plants, of insects, of other animals that are not cute or cuddly or attractive to us, but there are thousands of species that we are destroying. We are killing the planet. Driving a Prius isn't going to stop that. Changing your light bulbs isn't going to stop that. And you know, the ecological crisis is just a part of a larger problem, and that is the insane level of violence that we are witnessing. Today, today, while we are here, how many tens of thousands of children, children, will die of malnutrition. How many hundreds of millions of animals will die because they taste good? 
We are witnessing a crisis of violence, the likes of which we've never seen. How did we get into this mess? You know, you can't solve the problem unless you understand what the problem is. And I suggest that the problem is not the environment. It's not the, the problem's not out there. The problem's in here. The problem is in here, not out there. It's a problem of the spirit. It's a problem of the spirit. Now, how did this happen? How did we, how, I mean, how did we get here? Well, let's go back to the 18th century, period of time in the West known as the Enlightenment. In many ways, probably one of the most inaccurate labels I will get, ever given to um, a, a period of human history. But in any event, what happened in the 18th century? And I promise, I'll try not to bore you. If I do, Um But what happened in the 18th century? What happened in the 18th century was people were tired of the oppression and the dogmatism of the church. They were tired of, they, they didn't like the fact that they, they had to have faith in everything. They wanted to use their reason. They, they, want, they, they, were, they were tired of oppression. They wanted some recognition of the uniqueness of the individual, some recognition of the power of humans. Now, in and of themselves, that, those impulses, those concerns are not bad things. The notion that we don't like oppression, that we want to use our, our brains, that we don't want to be told we've got to believe, that we've got to follow... You know, that we are interested in the union, that we want to celebrate the uniqueness of the individual. Those are not bad things. The problem is how they got translated into this thing called the Enlightenment. Well, what happened in the Enlightenment was we took God out of the cell. We took the Judeo-Christian notion of the Creator God. We took God out of the picture and we put humans, specifically men, we put them at the center of the universe. Humans, men, were superior. Rationality was superior. That was, that was the new God. And the other thing that happened was we legitimized self-absorption. We legitimized selfishness. We put aside the notion of the community and we substituted in its place the notion of the rational, independent, powerful human being who didn't need anybody, who was not dependent on anyone, whose reason could solve any problem. What the Enlightenment gave birth to was egoism. That is what the Enlightenment gave birth to. It gave birth to the arrogance of egoism. It had profound political and economic consequences. For example, it's largely as a result of the Enlightenment that we got the economic system that is known as capitalism, where everything is commodified. Nothing has any inherent value. Things only have instrumental value. What's its value to me? What's your value to me? What's the value of that animal to me? What's the value of the environment to me? That's what capitalism is. It's the commodification of everything. That is what came out of the Enlightenment. Well, is it any wonder that we are where we are as a result of, of, of this thinking? We have relentless narcissism. We have extreme materialism. We commodify everything. We turn everything into a thing that only has economic value and no other value. And this sort of egoism has all over the world. After the fall of the Soviet Union, everyone says, well, communism didn't work. Capitalism reigns supreme, and that's the way it should be. I suggest to you, maybe communism wasn't a good thing. I'm not sure what we've all embraced as capitalism is also a good thing. 
Because that's why we're in the mess we're in today. Because everything has become something that has value only insofar as it has economic value. People have value only insofar as they have economic value. And if they don't have any economic value, they're garbage. They're put aside. They're thrown away. They're allowed to starve to death. They're allowed to get diseases. They're allowed not to have health care. That's not right. We know that's not right. We have abandoned our souls. That's the problem. The problem is not the environment. The problem is us. We have abandoned our souls. We have traded our souls for iPods and cell phones and fancy cars and things. We have bought into this insanity called materialism where we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves by what we have. We judge our value by what we've got. We judge other people. What do they have? What sort of car do they drive? What sort of house do they have? How much money do they have? How many degrees do they have? All of that sort of stuff. So, the problem is not the the, 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 the... the problem with the ecology, the problem with the violence we're seeing generally is not going to be solved until we get to the root problem. Until we, until we become radical. Getting to... That's what radical means. Getting to the root we have to get to the root problem, and the root problem is ourselves. And this is where Jainism comes in. Jainism recognizes the concerns that led to the that led to the Enlightenment. That is, if we think about it, Jainism also doesn't have a Judeo-Christian creator God. So, so Jainism recognizes that, you know, that, 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 that the concept of the creator God, the oppressor, the, per, the, the, the big thing in the sky that we all have to be frightened of, Jainism rejects that. But instead of placing the arrogant human or human reason as the only thing that replaces the Judeo-Christian creator God, what Jainism does is places at the center of the universe the inherent value of all jeev. And, and that is, that is uh, again, Jainism recognizes, recognizes the concerns that led us in the 18th century to reject the idea of the creator God at the center of the universe. But instead, it places something much healthier in its place. The inherent value of all jeev. And the other thing that Jainism does is it recognizes self-absorption, but not the egoism that characterizes our present situation and what happened as a result of the Enlightenment. But what Jainism recognizes as self-absorption is the recognition that the Kasai, the no Kasai, they are not part of the soul. They have nothing to do with us. That we only invite, we only invite more problems when we engage them, and that we need to be absorbed with ourselves in the sense of being absorbed with our soul. And what does that mean? It means being in touch with our essential essence, which is ahimsa. That is what our essential nature is. Jainism quite beautifully recognizes the dilemma that we face. Our essential nature is ahimsa. It is nonviolence. But yet, we live in a world where every day, however careful we are, we engage in some sort of violence. You know, I've been a vegan for a long time now. I don't wear wool. I don't wear leather. I don't wear silk. I don't walk on grass. As a matter of fact, you know, I end up doing all sorts of crazy things like walking around places so that I don't walk on the grass because I don't want to step on anything when I walk. I try to be very careful. If I find insects in the house, I, I, um, you know, I pick them up. And, stuff. and believe me, when I first got out of law school, I lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, where they have cockroaches that are like four feet long. And, and I used to have to, you know, and I, I was terrified of them when I first saw them. I mean, I thought they were 
I, I, I thought you could ride them, actually. They were, they were large. And, and I used to actually go around the house and I used to sort of catch, pick them up in little glasses and put them outside. And stuff. Um, but um, but uh, e- even, you know, even though I try real hard, um, I still, I'm sure when I drive my car, I, you know, I, I must run over insects. Um, I, I, I mean, you, you just, you can't avoid it. So we are in a dilemma situation in this world. We have an essential nonviolent nature, but yet we are forced every day to engage in conduct which is inimical to our souls. Jainism says the only solution to that is do the very best you can while every day making progress. Every day making progress to get back to your soul, get back to your ahimsa nature in hope you can break out of this because in the end, it ain't a lot of fun. So, Jainism is the, the answer to the problem because it gets to the cause of the problem. It is... It recognizes individuality, but rejects individualism. It is anti-egoism. It is ahimsa, not himsa. It recognizes inherent value, not instrumental value. You know, it's interesting. I'm writing something now about... Mahavir recognized 2,500 years ago the very concerns that were going to lead Western people to the Enlightenment 2,200 years later. He just prescribed a very, very different way of getting there. It's a shame we didn't listen to him. We would have saved ourselves, the planet, a whole lot of suffering and a whole lot of death. We need a revolution of the heart, a nonviolent revolution of the heart. We need to change ourselves. We're never going to solve the problems out there, never going to do that, until we solve the problems in here. And I want to make to you a call to action in the sense that, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, I understand that there's a very, very, let me say again, I understand that there's a very strong inclination not to proselytize in Jainism. I understand that, and I respect that. But there's nothing wrong, I, I think, with sharing the Ratnateya with those whose hearts are open to it and who want to encounter it, who want to have encounters with it. I mean, if Guru Dev Chitrabhanuji, he did not come here to proselytize. He came here because he recognized that people were hungry for this, that when they heard the message, they, they gravitated to it. They wanted it. That's not proselytizing. That's being generous and giving it to them. And that's what I am asking all of us to do. And I'm grateful to you and to, for the, to the Samnijis, to everybody who has taught me, to, to Pravin, to Sulek, to all of you who have taught me. Nobody proselytized me. Nobody forced me into it. I came to it. I wanted to learn it. You know, I've had an interesting experience over the past two years. I teach a course. I've been teaching a course in animal rights for longer than many people in this room have been alive. But um, the past couple of years, in, my, in the course that Anna Charlton and I teach on human rights and animal rights, I talk about Jainism. I talk about Ahimsa. And then what I do is I say to the students, and by the way, and I tell them, I'm a Jain. And they always ask me, they say, well, you know, you don't wear one of those face masks and sweep. And I say, well, you know, that's true. I tell. But, but, um, but that's a, sort of a stereotype of Jainism, and, and you've got to understand it's, you know, from... And, and I always say to them, look, if you want to know more, I've got a little booklet. This is Pravin's 901, his 901, uh, Jainism, Religion of Compassion and Ecology. And I take stacks of them because, because Pravin sends me boxes of these things. And I take, I put a stack on the table and I say, if you want a book on Jainism, if you want to learn more about Jainism, here, come up after class and take the book. And 90% of the kids come up and take a book. I had 100 people. I taught this both semesters last semester, last year. I had 100 kids in that class. In, those, in that class. And I had 90 kids at least, probably more, 
come up and take 901 and read it and then start emailing me. What does Atma mean? What is, you know, what, what, uh, explain the Lesha to me and things like that. Can we talk more about this? And I'm not proselytizing. I'm offering to them and they're picking right up on it because they read it and it speaks to their souls. So what I suggest to you is realize something. This is, this is a wonderful gift you all have. I mean, I really hope. I mean, I know I'm not going to make moksha this time around. I really, I really, I know, I know I'm not. <laughs> I can guarantee you I'm not. Um, and, and I know, and I just keep, I keep hoping. I, I say, please, let me, let me get enough, enough good karma so that I come back next time in a Jain family so that at least I can know. <laughs> so, so, that, so that I can, so that I can know Hindi and Gujarati because... Yesterday's opening ceremony, I, I understood about 10% of it. Um, and and, uh, and where was, where's Yoga Hundred Jane? He was sitting there next. Uh, Yoga, oh, there he is. He was sitting next to me, and he was like leaning over and whispering, saying, "Now they're saying. Now they're saying." And and I just hope next time around, I want to I want to know Hindi and Gujarati. Um, but in any event, so the, we, you want to do something about ecology? You want to save the planet? Then share your Jainism. Help. Let us help. All of us help and commit ourselves to the revolution of the, of the, of the heart and spreading the nonviolent revolution of the heart and spreading the concept, the Jain concept of self-realization, the concept of letting, let's get back to our ahimsa nature. Now, I just want to, I want to say two final things. And don't think that, you know, we're getting to the end of it because two final things could go on for a long time. I'm sort of... I'm anxiously watching a show, you know, because he's going to hold up the sign soon. Shut up. Um, okay. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a perigreje. You know, we, we always talk about how, well, you know, we should be non-possessive. And it's great for the ascetics because, you know, the ascetics, they, they can do this, and you know, but the rest of us, you know, we all own things and blah, blah, blah. You know what? We all need to work. We all need to aspire more. We, you know, we all, we ought to blur the distinction more between the lay person and the ascetic. We all ought to aspire more to the asceticism, particularly when it comes to a perigreje. We are all too materialistic, all of us. Every single one of us. And we've got to learn, we've got to get rid of things. You know, I have a, I drive an Alexis, I, or an Alexis, a, a Forester. I have a Forester. It's 10 years old. It has 200,000 miles on it. But you know what? It still works real well. I still get great mileage out of it. And, and people say to me, how come you don't buy another car? And the answer is, why should I buy another car? And I said, because you're driving around in a 10-year-old car, and you're a distinguished professor, and you've got all these titles. And the answer is, I don't care. You know, I don't care. I'm gonna, I'll, dri I'll drive that thing until it stops working. You know, and as I, I once had, I literally, I had once had a Volkswagen that literally fell apart while I was driving down Route 70 in Cherry Hill. It just stopped working, and I, that was it. They came, they towed it away. I never saw it again. But, um, but and that had over 250,000 miles on it. But, but the things we all need to consume less. We all need to consume less. All of us. The other thing I want to bring up to you, and again, with Jami Dukadam. I want you to please, and I say this to you as my Jane family, don't be angry with me, please. But please, I want you to think about this notion of strict vegetarianism. You know, we, we draw this artificial distinction between, you know, we don't eat flesh, we don't eat beef, we don't eat poultry, we don't eat fish, we don't eat eggs, we don't eat honey, but milk and ghee and wool and, and silk, and they're okay. I suggest to you, with all respect, and I'm not trying to be oppressive, dogmatic, or anything else. I'm just sharing with you, my family, you can't make that distinction, people. It doesn't work. It all involves himself. All of it. You know, the, the milk that we drink, where does that come from? It comes from some cow that has suffered. And believe me, I have been on organic farms, non-organic farms, you know, big, big ones, small ones, ones here, ones in other places. They're all, they all, the best of them, the best of them involves himsa, horrible amounts of himsa. 
We take the calves from the mothers. You know, one of the saddest things I ever saw, I was at an organic dairy farm in Vermont for a couple of days observing. One of the saddest things I ever experienced was what, what the mothers do, what the cows do when they take the calves away. And in this farm, they let them stay with them much longer than they do in the normal intensive farm where they take them away in two days. They let them stay for a few more days. But the mothers cry, and they cry for days, and they walk around looking for their calves. It's horrible. And even in the organic dairy farms, even in the really the, the ones that we would regard as quote more humane, that's a very bad word to use for any any sort of animal agriculture, but even in the best of those situations, the the the, the calf is deprived of the mother's milk, and they they oftentimes have to tie the the, the calf's mouth shut so that the, the calf doesn't suckle too much, or they separate them and they tie, the, they tether the calf. Somebody. It's horrible. And you know what? All of those cows that we're drinking the milk from, they all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway. It's him, It's inextricably intertwined. You can't say, you can't say meat's one thing, dairy's another thing. Believe me, there is more suffering in a glass of milk than in a pound of steak. There is more suffering in a glass of milk than in a pound of steak. I, would, I, I am absolutely convinced of that. The wool that we wear, where does that come from? It is shorn from sheep. Have you ever watched that happen? It's horrible. It involves horrible suffering inflicted on those animals. You know, they have, there's something called mule sink which I never knew about until I visited a wool farm. You know, the, 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 the flies... The flies attack the, the tails of, the, um, uh, 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 of the, the sheep, and they lay eggs, and they call it a, a fly strike. So what they do to stop the maggots from accumulating around the tail of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the sheep is they strip the skin. They, take, they peel the skin off, and it takes about two weeks for it to heal. It is horrible. Those poor animals cry and cry and cry, and... Where do those sheep end up? They end up in the same slaughterhouse that the sheep for meat end up because they all end up getting killed. And this idea that people say, well, you know, the wool I'm wearing didn't come from a sheep that, that, that was killed. And the answer is, you don't know that because they shear, they shear them on the way to the slaughterhouse. They don't separate out that wool. You can't separate out that wool. All goes into the same batch. And even if the, 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 the clothes that you're wearing didn't come from a sheep that was killed that time, that sheep's going to be killed sometime. It all involves himsa, all of it. All of it. You can't separate it out. And you know what? There are alternatives now. Same thing for silk. I mean, even a himsa, what they call a himsa silk. Uh, if, you, you know, if, if any of you are interested, i got plenty of information on uh, himsa silk, and we can talk about that. All involves himsa. But we don't need it. And, you know, you know, and this is not a trivial issue. It's not just a question of my preference versus your preference. It's a question of what does a himsa mean? What does a himsa mean? And if in the end, if in the end, we are, if in the end we, what we're doing is inflicting intentional suffering on mobile, multi-sense beings, I mean, we can't avoid all harm. We can't avoid all violence. But we are, all of us, ascetic, not ascetic, everybody's enjoined from inflicting intentional harm on multi-sense beings. And in the end, what's our best justification for the milk that we drink, for the ghee that we use, for the wool that we wear? We like it. It tastes good. It tastes good. If that's what a hymnza means, people, then I think we would all agree that that's an impoverished meaning. That's, that's not what it means. What it means is that we all have to struggle every single day to minimize violence. And we don't minimize violence when we pour death into our tea. When we pour that level of suffering into our tea, we just don't. And there are alternatives now. This morning, when I was down at breakfast, they had the silk soy milk. It's delicious. I mean, believe me, when I became a vegan 28 or 30 years ago, whatever it was, Soy milk would have gotten you sick. It was horrible. I, was, I remember the first time I ate soy ice cream, I got ill. Um, but, but now there are alternatives, and they're wonderful alternatives. You don't need ghee anymore. I do lots of, I do lots of Indian cooking. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, will, I will like to challenge anyone here 
to see whether you can make a better common dokla than I can. Um, but, uh, okay, that's my challenge to you. Um, and, and, um, <laughs> And, and I, wa I wanted to, you know, I, I did want to mention, because I mentioned Yogananda Jain yesterday about, uh, about his helping me understand the Hindi. You know, one of the great things, we have to all be prepared to talk about Jainism with people that we, that, who, who are interested in talking about it. Yoga Hendra, it, it, you've got these, have you got these with you? He's got these, he's got these little cards. It's like, it's like a cheat sheet for Jainism. It's got, it's got everything you need, you know, it's, it's got Anikantavada, Aperigrehe, Ahimsa, and a little card, a little business card. You can carry it in your wallet, and, and when people ask you, what are the essentials of Jainism, you can tell them what the essentials of Jainism are. But, um, the final point I'm going to make, and this will be short, I promise, um, and that is, one of the arguments that I hear from people about the strict vegetarianism versus non-strict vegetarianism is the notion that, well, Anikantavada says there's no absolute truth. You know, Anikantavada says there's no absolute truth. And I suggest to you, or, or that all truth is relative. If, if veganism is my truth, it's not necessarily true. My friends, Anikantavada does not mean truth is relative. It means truth is complex. Truth is multi-sided. That's what it means. It doesn't mean, it's, doesn't mean there's no truth. Well, there are truths. Because if there's no truth, then ahimsa is not true. You know? And, and so I want to leave you with the thoughts of, again, I don't, I'm not meaning to make any of you feel uncomfortable. I just want you to think about what I want to share with you as my family, my thoughts on this, and I want you to think about when you're using dairy, when you're using ghee, when you're using... Well, think about it. If the best justification we have for doing those things is that they taste good, then how is that any different from the meat eater who says, it tastes good, I like it. And don't delude yourself, my friends. There is no such thing as humanely exploited animals. Talking about humane exploitation of animals is like talking about humane concentration camps. There is no such thing. It doesn't exist. And you know, um, people have said to me, well, but 2,500 years ago, it was different. Maybe it was different 2,500 years ago. And maybe, you know, I don't know what happened 2,500 years ago. I wasn't there, at least. Not that I remember. But, um, uh, but there is no drop of milk that any of us can buy whether we're here, whether we're in, we're in Mumbai, whether we're in, it doesn't matter where we are. As a matter of fact, I just got some very, very interesting information from a man at the London School of Economics who has gone around India taking, uh, uh, studying uh, uh, dairy collectives, small dairy collectives in India, which are supposed to be humane, and he has concluded it's absolutely horrible in these small dairy collectives. There is no such thing as humane exploitation. But, going back to my point about Anikantavada, this notion that there is no absolute truth, we have to be, we must reject it. That's not what Anikantavada means. It means truth is complex. I want to read to you from the Achanga Sutra, the fourth lecture on righteousness. The Adiyats and Bhagavats of the past, present, and future all thus speak thus, declare thus, explain thus. All breathing, existing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain, nor treated with violence, nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. This is the pure, unchangeable, eternal law, which the clever ones who understood the world have declared. It sounds to me like the Agams tell us, point us, tell us that there we can't justify this. So I ask you please to think about this. Jai Janendra, Namo Vitragaya, and thank you very much for having me.
I made him Jane. He's going to make us Jane. I want to tell you what a brilliant legal mind he has. Someone wrote to me because I'm a Jaina president that I would know the answer if a herd of cow, four cows catch a disease that might inflict the entire herd and they will all die. Would it be all right to kill the four cows? I wanted to give a Jane answer, but I couldn't fake it that time. So I asked around a few people to answer that student. And I asked Gary. Gary said it's a false choice. They're not trying to save the rest of those cows out of any concern for their lives. It's their economic capital they're trying to save. Bavinsa. He told me about Bavinsa. I had to go home and look it up. But it made more sense. Many times when we have to make choices, it's enlightened people who could give us guidance. I look to Gary for my guidance too. And he corrects my English, helps me write. Thank you very much. Thank you.